Um, I'm going to bring us back to some fundamentals. Uh, I was one of the co-authors of the previous edition, actually, of British Maritime Doctrine, the Fundamentals of British Maritime Doctrine, uh, when, it was, when it was done in the, 19, in the 1990s, early 1990s. And it was quite influential. I mean, it was some influence on James when he did the first edition of the, uh, of the Australian one. And um, I think it's important that, and I wouldn't disagree with anything Jeff said, and certainly not what Michael Howard said, or wrote, but I think it's important, though, that you do recognize what is the normal, as Corbett put it, because if you understand what is the normal, then you understand what you're doing when you're departing from it. And I think that's a very important way of thinking. When I was asked to put a theoretical section by my publisher at the back of The Future of Sea Power, which was published a long time ago, a very bad time to publish a book about sea power, the end of the Cold War when everything was changing. Well, at least not quite everything, perhaps. I looked at Ken Booth's Triangle, and, uh, which we had a, a session about at the conference. I don't know how, how many of you were there. And I thought that actually that was actually quite a good way of looking at and interpreting what navies do. It has since been developed in the latest iteration, although the triangle has disappeared, I think, but it's, it's been developed in the latest edition of British Maritime Doctrine. And I think with some additions, and I've been adding bits to it and taking bits away during the conference, um, and I might write actually an article about this, broadening the concept and concepts in various ways. I think it still holds true in uh, what navies are for, uh, what the roles of navies are, and what in fact the Royal Australian Navy is for, and why, and I think it should have a pretty uh, secure future. I'm very gratified, I mean, to hear the head of army making that speech. I could hear the first sea lord's mouth watering. And he is very much looking forward to uh, sending a copy with a note in green ink uh, to uh, the chief of the general staff. I hope it will do him some good. Because despite what I've heard once or twice in Australia, Britain being a maritime orientated country, would that it were true? I live in a country now which th thinks that all servicemen are soldiers, that the armed forces is the army. Uh, and in which the Navy, but the Navy is fighting back because the strategic environment is changing. Getting out of those stupid and useless conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, in my opinion, uh, has finally produced a situation where strategic realities are reasserting themselves. And of course, Australia is a maritime country. As your national anthem says, it may have been interpreted in terms of beach and barbecues, but actually the country is surrounded by sea and depends very much on a capacity to use the sea for all, those, for all the functions, the amount of seafood one eats here, uh, transport, and of course the use of the sea as a medium uh, for the projection of military power. Now, the primary roles for a navy, as opposed to a maritime police force or a, or a coast guard, are military. And that's why Ken Booth and myself put at the bottom of the infamous triangle the military functions. Power projection. Sea control. You might say you put sea control first, but actually we have tended to take sea control for granted, perhaps wrongly, as Paul Dibb was saying. You know, we have need to concentrate more on the methods of sea control. Navies are now very good at air control as well. Look at the ballistic missile defense stand over there, and uh, the deployment of ballistic missile defense ships in the Mediterranean protecting us Europeans from ballistic missile attack. And if you can't do sea control, which is of course being able to use the seas for your purposes in a particular area for a particular period of time, uh, then you might actually at least be able to, to, to uh, deal in sea denial. And the capacities of maritime forces to engage in sea denial are getting very great. Uh, much talk, of course, about AAAD, anti-access area denial, and how you counter those capabilities. I won't say which country might deploy them. It might uh, lead to a diplomatic incident. Uh, but we all know who it is. So these are the military roles of navies. And they are absolutely crucial. And I'm very pleased to see that the Australian Navy is enhancing its capabilities in this area. Uh, the building of the LHDs, excellent thing to do, uh, the building of the air defense destroyers, and so on. I'm not so sure about spending quite so much money on submarines. Submarines are useful, and as you, for political reasons, deny yourself the only sensible kinds of submarines which are nuclear-powered, certainly given your ranges, I'm not at all sure that building a large number of conventional submarines, however technologically advanced, is a sensible thing to do. However, they do have certain advantages, uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, and they are quite. And, and, and I can see why they would, would play a part in the military roles of the um, 
of the, uh, of the, of the Royal Australian Navy. But of course, these military roles, important though they are, tend to be only part of what navies are about. And here we come to the other parts of the triangle, the diplomatic role, as Ken and myself put it. Now it's become, as you heard from, well, some of you heard, perhaps heard from First Sea Lord, now international engagement. And this can range from a whole range of things. Uh, as uh, James Cable wrote about uh, coercive diplomacy short of war. I did wonder when Sir James published that book, um, sadly no longer with us, of course. Uh, they always think you, uh, it's best if you read James Cable's work at the speed at which he said it. <laughs> it does help. It's very dense. Uh, but he, 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 he analyzed in a masterly way the ways in which navies can be used for coercive diplomacy. Um, I'm told by the first seal that I mustn't say gunboat diplomacy because that will mean we'll all go off and build littoral combat ships or stupid things like those. So, um, the, um, so but coercive diplomacy is, a, is the way forward. Showing the flag, uh, Sir James really, he differentiated between showing the flag. And now I think we've got to add, and I'm very pleased, as I wrote long ago about naval cooperation and, uh, and so on, um, um, a cooperative security engagement exercises with as many countries as you feel you can exercise with, possibly even countries. You might think of as at least potential enemies, but perhaps they won't become potential enemies if you exercise with them. Discussions on confidence building and a whole range of fora. The most important thing I've ever done in my life was starting the, what, what are now the, fr the, the fracas talks, France, Russia, UK, US talks, which actually, even in recent years, when we weren't talking to Russia because of Georgia, were a very important point of contact between the Western navies and um, and Russia, and, 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 it was, uh, and, and whatever forum one chooses, and there are various fora available in this region, I know almost a bewildering array of them, uh, and acronyms and abbreviations, uh, uh, that is a very useful thing. And as has been said already, seamen naturally get on. I knew that what were called the Adderbury, Adderbury conversations when they started, the ancestor of, of Fruckus would work, because sailors get on with each other. They all share that common enemy, the sea. And another diplomatic, uh, area, which I think one can say comes under on the diplomatic side of the triangle, is capacity building. Australia's done a marvellous amount of capacity building uh, in, in, in giving uh, the means for uh, the Pacific uh, Islands to engage in constabulary operations. And this brings us quite tidily to the next side of the triangle, which is constabulary operations, maritime security operations, and a word which we invented in BR 1806, that's the British Maritime Doctrine, benign operations. That is operations where you're not in, you aren't even enforcing any law, but you are engaging in activities which your capacity to carry out military operations gives you. I remember there was a conference about disaster relief several years ago in Britain and making the point in an interview I gave that in fact this to some extent is a kind of free good because navies are good at repairing things. They have to be to keep their ships afloat when they're hit. They're very good at doing the kinds of things which are highly, highly useful in a disaster relief situation. So call it what you like, constabulary, maritime security, benign. Of course, now, with the, um, with the enclosure of the world's oceans and the importance of uh, all kinds of things uh, in, 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 in the world ocean, from in and under the world ocean, from fish and oil, gas, etc., safeguarding natural resources and their legal exploitation is very important. This leads into the general maintenance of good order against all those criminal activities that were spoken about this morning, and notably, of course, piracy. I do wish people wouldn't say that countering piracy was a non-traditional activity. It shows a profound ignorance of naval history. Countering piracy has been a major naval activity as long as there have been navies, and indeed before. At times, of course, like Queen Elizabeth, we connived with the pirates to, as the cheapest way of creating a navy. But then once we got a permanent national maritime fighting force, we actually used it to counter piracy. A lot of activity which is not really well known uh, in, the, in the 17th century when we owned Tangier, in the when England owned Tangier, in the Mediterranean, against the Barbary pirates. And the Barbary pirates, of course, combine Islamist terrorism and piracy. What's new about that? Nothing at all. Please read more history. <laughs> it's very useful. So counter-piracy, counter-terrorism, and countering illegal movements of people. 
Did we forget about the Royal Navy's activities against the slave trade? That was illegal, illegal movement of people. Nothing new about that. But I think actually, and I was stimulated by the discussion this morning, I think we ought to pay a lot more attention to how this was done in the past, how counter-piracy operations were carried out in the past, how, counter, anti, how anti-slavery patrolling was carried out. And this went on for a long time. Well, not just the Atlantic slave trade, the Indian Ocean slave trade. So all these things have been done for a very long period. They aren't new. They haven't just been invented. Search and rescue, of course. Naval forces, that might not be their, 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 their primary role, but, but naval forces, maritime forces in a broader sense, have, have, have the kinds of capabilities that are very useful in search and rescue. And of course, it's a very good way on the other side of the triangle uh, to make friends and influence people cooperating about that. Humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. Very important. And uh, we've seen various examples in the region. That's not what you primarily keep your navy for, but it gives you the capabilities to actually engage in that activity, which is a good thing in itself, as well as having a bit of impact on the other side of the triangle. Peacekeeping. has been a great deal, actually, of official sort of maritime peacekeeping. The Gulf of Fonseca is an interesting example with the little motorboats painted white uh, to try and maintain some kind of truce there. But it is a constabulary role. Uh, it is not a warfighting role. Peace support operations of a different kind are warfighting. We tried to make this distinction very clear uh, in 1806, that there is a distinction between a peace enforcement uh, and peacekeeping. And other things like enforcing sanctions. When you have decisions of the Security Council, which sometimes we pay attention to, we usually ignore them if we, if we don't like them uh, these days, uh, that, 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 that in fact, uh, uh, they, when sanctions are, are, are imposed on a state, then obviously because of the importance of maritime trade, maritime force is a very important part of doing that. So there's a whole string of things you can put. If you feel geometrically inclined, you can put a circle on the, uh, with the side of the triangle as the, as the, as the day. Uh, 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 and, and, um, but all those kinds of things, I think, come, broadly speaking, under the constabulary, maritime security, and benign area. So maintaining a navy for the basic tasks of defending Australia allows you to maintain in, the broader, in a broader interpretation of that, as Paul Dibb explained so brilliantly this morning, the broader interpretation of this allows you to influence events in your region, to play a part with your major ally, the United States, to, and to, and to uh, help maintain security in the broadest sense in this region. The full capacity to fight at the highest level may not be necessary, although I can't help feeling when people say there isn't going to be a war in my lifetime or whatever, just again look at history. Look at the interconnections between Germany and the, and the British Empire in 1914 and so on. It can come by surprise. Very important to have incidents at sea agreements of things to try to stop war breaking out by accident. So that I, those basic verities, if you like, which I would argue still are basic, are very important as your starting point for the creative thinking of which Jeff was talking you ought to take. Because circumstances do, do change history, never entirely repeats itself. But if you forget its lessons, you can be in deep trouble. Thank you.